Good evening, everybody. It is office hours time again. Uh, I'm not sure when you joined that, uh, joined the call and, and saw the little montage there. Uh, I noticed that as, as the week went on, I was in India, I got more and more ragged looking. So uh, I probably look pretty ragged tonight. It's been a, a, a tough week, but um, I, I suppose the easiest way of describing that was someone shared with me a uh, compliment. They said, oh, yeah. They said, the reason I came to your session, this, is, this was in Hyderabad, I think. They said, hi, Connor, the reason I came to your session is I saw that on LinkedIn, I was born in the same year you became a DBA. So, uh, yeah, so apparently I think that was meant to be a compliment. Uh, but, yeah, that's pretty much how I felt uh, toward the end of the week. But anyway, I digress. Uh, lots of things to talk about, as always. Uh, for those who tuned in last Thursday and saw that I'd shifted a week, my apologies. But, yes, I was overseas. And so we had to um, shift office hours and um, get it set up for tonight. So let me share my screen and we'll get straight back into it as per normal. <laughs> You're looking fine for an old guy. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that reminds me of another one in India where someone came up to me and said, oh, no, sorry, I'll tell you, it was at Doag last year. Someone said, oh, I really enjoy your YouTube channel. It's nice to see someone so old making YouTube videos. So there we go. That's all I can, uh, now I can, you know, I can do my office hours and then I can cry myself to sleep later on tonight. But uh, as I said, sing out in the chat line if you um, obviously have any questions or comments as we go today and, um, and we'll see how we go. So let me just adjust my screen so I can see everything I need to see. Okay, as always, getting in touch was easy. Scan the QR code or just go to linktree slash Connor or hit me up on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, DMs are always open and that linktree will take you to all the other ways you might choose to have your social media preferred, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc., etc. As I always say, if you're new to the call, no need to adjust your set. The slide content normally appears at the left or down toward the bottom, such that when we make this into a YouTube video, uh, it becomes uh, a little bit useful. And as I always say, there's nothing worse than having the speaker's head covering that critical piece of code that you are hoping for. So we do it this way, such that hopefully uh, the resultant video comes out usable as well. As always, I like to do a little bit of bits and pieces as to what's been going on and what's been coming up. Um, this is the big one. Uh, you probably, if you, unless you've been living under a rock, you would have seen that we've now uh, sort of shifted on SQL Developer. Fantastic product's been out for 20 years as a Java platform, but let's face it, probably the dominant coding IDE in the world is VS Code, uh, not for itself, but the fact that there's like a bazillion plugins for it for just about any language and tool you have the need for. And we followed suit. You can now get SQL Developer for VS Code. It literally is fire up VS Code, search for SQL Developer and install the extension as you're off and running. So yeah, so give it a go. Um, it's going to be a continuous work in progress. The fact that it's now an extension means we can roll out updates incredibly quickly and efficiently. So the first cut, you'll see all the basic, you know, the fundamentals of object browsing, the SQL worksheet, etc. But as you know, over 20 years, SQL Developer, the Java tool, has grown to be an incredibly powerful set of facilities, and those facilities will piecemeal make their way into VS Code as well. Um, I got back from India last week, had a week in India for a series of events. One of them was Cloud World in Mumbai, a uh, fantastic event, literally 3,000 people. They had a big O at the start there. They also had all sorts of, you know, I took my, the plushie was there. Uh, you notice the plushie is wearing the, uh, the Indian traditional dress. Uh, my friend Sai put that on and we, call, we called him Oris Swami. And um, yeah, so we had the Red Bull stand and all that normal stuff there. So fantastic event. And um, the reason I want to put that there is because there are other Cloud World events perhaps coming near you. The next one off the bat is Cloud World and London. And yes, they are free. So uh, even if you just want to go along and have a fantastic lunch and network with people, it's still worth while you're going. But obviously, there's a whole stack of quality sessions as well. I think there's about 40 or 50 sessions at Cloud World, of which 10 to 20 are database and developer focused. So lots of goodies there. But even if you didn't go any sessions, you could actually get lots of cool stuff just by going along and meeting your peers. So check out Cloud World in London. Funnily enough, in terms of actually what's coming up, I would call it, well, what's the, call it a little bit of a dry spell. And what I mean that is, is what tends to happen is generally March seems to be a relatively quiet time for conferences. It's almost like from April through to the end of the year, it all ramps up. 
And so, yeah, so the one that stands out at the moment is Apex Worlds coming up very shortly. You can see they're just um, toward the end of March. If you're an Apex person or just general database development person, check out that. I've been to Apex World in the past. Uh, really fantastic event held by the Dutch user group. So, yeah, check it out and it's coming up. So what I did last week, I did this thing called the AIUG Special Events. I went to Delhi, Pune, Hyderabad, and Bangalore. We ran lots of cool events, lots of selfies, lots of fantastic people, lots of fun there, a really good popular event. And the reason I dwell on that is A, as I always say, support your local user groups. They've been doing it hard since COVID, and the more we support them, uh, the more attendees we get at these conferences, the more attendees we get at the conferences, the more speakers we get, and the more speakers we get, the more sponsorship from Oracle, etc. So it's like this continuous loop. You put in, and you know sponsors come running, sponsors come running, you get better content, and you get more people, and the cycle continues. So please get along to your local user group events, and uh, we can build our community continuously. Okay, what do we got to talk about tonight? I list them here in bullet points in no particular order. We got date functions, the merge command when it comes to partitions, a SQL transpiler, a 23C feature, better lobs in 23C, the access and filter operations, automatic transaction rollback, a 23C feature, and data pumping a single table space. So the 23C ones pretty much came out of uh, last week in India where I did some talks on 23C and afterwards we would have uh, free Q&A and these are a few that came out and I didn't have answers for them immediately and so I said come to office hours next week and I'll answer them in, in more detail and the other ones are just questions that have been submitted uh, over the past few weeks or so which I like to talk about on office hours. As always let me move my chat so I can actually see it in case you need to talk to me but as always yes chat line, Q&A, and we'll jump back and forth between demos and slides and see how we go. So the first one is access versus filter. I understand the difference between access and filter operations, but sometimes the optimizer seems to switch between them for no apparent reason. Can you explain this? And we'll have a crack at it. So the first thing is, let's talk about what these two things are. When you see them in an execution plan, the term access normally means we access uh, a subset of rows using an index. We probe the index to directly get a subset of the rows in the table. A filter is with a set of rows, whether it's already been subsetted by the access command or whether you're just scanning the entire table, is a filter is effectively a check against rows as they become candidates. So access says hone in on a subset of the rows. And filter says with that subset, or if there was no access with all the rows, simply check them as you scan them generally applying a where clause predicate. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at both those tonight and then we'll explore the question, which is how come the optimizer sometimes to have this strange jump between them? So with that, let's jump onto a demo. I'm gonna create a table called T. It's a copy of DBA tables, around about 40,000 rows or so, but I've chosen a where clause here so that I only get four, was it four? Uh, five distinct owners. So I've got the Sys system schema, Scott HR and Apex 23. Nothing special about those. I just knew that there were, there were five that existed in this database. And so I've got five distinct owner columns. I gather some stats and then I run a query and there's no indexes on this table yet. So I do select star from T where owner equals Sys, table name equals triple G. And we can see we do table access full. And down below we have this predicate information. And it says on line one, when you were scanning the table, we did a filter. And the filter is very simple. The filter is just, okay, as I look at each row, simply is the table name triple G and is the owner sys. That's what a filter is. As rows pass through me, I'm going to filter out the ones that I'm interested in. Let me now put an index on that table, an index on owner and table name, because you can imagine that's the query we're about to be running. So now I'll do the same query, where owner equals sys and table name equals triple G. The plan has changed. We've now changed to using an index. And it says line one is table access by index row ID batched. It's a batched index lookup, but the key one is line two. It's an index range scan. If we jump down to the predicate information, you can see it says I'm doing an access as opposed to a filter. What this is saying is I can navigate directly through the index to that particular index key, the index key being sys and, um, and GGG. And from there, I can get the rows I need. I don't need to do any other filtering because the only two predicates on this on this query are owner and table name, and that's what the index is on. So I'm only doing an access. That'll get me straight to the subset of rows that are required. It automatically does the filtering, so to speak. 
If I was to add a third predicate, so now I'm doing owner equals sys, table name triple G, and table space equals TS. Well, table space name is not in the index. So now we have the combination of the two. You can see there in the plan, it's still an index lookup. But on line two, down in the predicate information, we've done access. We've narrowed the set of rows across all rows down to just those with owner equals sys and table name equals triple G. With that subset of rows, I can now apply a filter. Now I can only apply the filter at line one, which is when I go back to the table to look at the data because table space name is not in the index. So effectively, I now get that subset of rows from the index with that subset of rows, read the tables and now actually filter to get the final predicate applied. So we can see we can have access, we can have filter, and of course we can have access and filter all in the same query. That all makes sense. Similarly, if I augment the query a little bit, and now I'm saying where owner equals sys and table name is in F and G. So now I have sort of an or. You can see I've still managed to do it with access. You can see down at line three, it says access owner equals sys. So come in through sys and then probe for the table name being F or G, but it can all be managed through the index lookup. And if I extend that to three values, it also still uses access. Extend it to four values, it still uses access. And you can see, you'll be seeing where I'm going there as we continue on this demo. Even with five, nothing required a filter. I just did the whole thing via an index because owner and table name were in the index. So that all makes sense. Everything's working totally fine as you'd logically expect. So Hammond said, I, I like that all my demos are quickly rerunnable with a cleanup. I would love to say that, you know, I wrote my scripts just like one and done and they work like that. No, they get iterated through many, many, many times before office hours starts to make sure that I'm not going to get myself in too much trouble uh, when we run them. But uh, I, I appreciate the, um, the compliment. So I'll drop that table. I'm going to recreate that table now, but not with just the five schemas, but with all the schemas in this database. I can't remember offhand how many there are, but you know, an Oracle database with default schemas normally has maybe a 20 or so, so a few of my own, let's say 25, it doesn't really matter. What we have now is a different data distribution, and we're going to repeat this demo. I'm going to put the index on straight away, so we'd expect that when you do queries on owner and table name, we will do an access. And let's see if that's the case. So owner equals sys, table name equals f. And as you can see, just like we've seen before, table access by index row ID, index range scan, and all the hard lift, all the heavy lifting was done in the access phase. Line two, owner equals sys and table name equals f. At which page you're probably thinking, where is this going? You're just gonna repeat this. Okay, let's do this now. Owner equals sys, table name in f and g. Look at what's happened. Line two, which is only an index scan. So we're still only on an index scan here on line two. But if we jump down to the predicate information, it said, well, what I'll do is I'll access all the rows that just have an owner of sys, and then I'll do a filter. So I'm still filtering within the index, but I'm not doing an access anymore. Rather than going access for sys and f and sys and g, it said, I'll just get the owner predicate first. Get gives me a range of rows with the owner equals sys, and then I'll scan along them inside the index using a filter. Now, why did it do this? Well, let's continue on. One of the things that you'll see out on the intertube somewhere is that, well, you can overcome this by using the hint batch table access by row ID. And if you throw that hint in, and this is what happens when you use undocumented hints, you'll see that nothing changes. It actually says you still came in on a sys, and then we actually filtered some rows within the index. Recall the, one, the query I had before, which was just sys and a single predicate of f, it used an access. So somewhere in there, the optimizer said, I'm going to jump to using this sort of combination method. I can put in this hint, once again, another undocumented hint, num index keys for this particular table and index is two. And when I do that, notice we've now reverted. Down in the predicate information that says on line three, I'll be doing all of it with an access command. So I'll go in on sys and table name F, and then I'll probe on sys and table name G. I've gone back to that same result we saw when we only had the five schemas, the different data distribution. So obviously the data distribution, the number of owners, the number of distinct owners and the distribution of data has an impact here on what decision the optimizer is making. I've overridden it here with this uh, undocumented hint. I'm not advising you should use this by the way. If I add in FG and H, 
Now, because I got the hint in there, it still does all of access. So this demonstrates it wasn't as if the access of the, the sole access facility was impossible. It's just that the optimizer chose not to use it by default. Similarly, and in fourth predicate, and it can still use access. And even the fifth predicate, we can still use that solely an access operation. Even though by default, the optimizer has flipped to using an access and a filter in combination. Now, I want to stress here that two, that number two and the number of index keys wasn't related in any way to the number of entries in my in list. If I jump up num index keys and say a value of three, you can see there right down at the bottom at the hint report, something that came in in 19C onwards, it says that is no longer a hint that's going to be used. I've got it's unused, that used stand there says I'm unused, I'm not using that hint. So three is actually not valid. And you can see we actually went to this interesting thing. We use, we use the access, but we didn't actually use this hint. So we get this sort of interesting combination of the two. Let's go back to the slides. So what's going on here? In terms of an access, right, a solely an access uh, facility, if I'm doing, say, a in list of two elements, what the optimizer is choosing to do is say, okay, we're going in an owner equals uh, sys and table name equals f, and I'll probe the index for that particular branch. Then I go another probe on sys and g because they are two uh, closely related but slightly separated index keys. When it flipped over to using an access and filter combination, it did something like this. It said, what I'll do is I'll just come in on sys. That will give me a slightly broader range of index keys to search through, and then I'll simply use a filter to find the F and the G. So diagrammatically, that's the different thing that it's actually gone on there, and that the optimizer has made that decision. Ultimately, what I'm saying is you shouldn't have to worry about this. Yes, you could overwrite it with, uh, overwrite it with undocumented hits. I would never recommend undocumented hits. It's just a bad idea. But it's just worth knowing that the concept of if all the predicates are available exclusively by the index, that does not mandate that the optimizer will use an access facility only. Even if the only predicates are index columns, the optimizer can choose an access. It can choose an access and filter combination. I'd be very surprised if it would use just a filter combination because typically that means it's not going to bother using the index at all. But yeah, some interesting observations there made by one of our customers, and I thought I'd explore it. Let's have a look at the Q&A. Ah, Oren has pointed out, in a sort merge join, the second branch always contains both access predicate and filter predicate, both with the same condition. Can I explain the rationale for this? Uh, no, but I will find out. I'll speak to Nigel, our optimizer PM, and um, let me note that down, and we will actually bear with me while I cut and paste that, because I'm always worried about losing my Zoom information at the end of the session. Okay, thanks, Aaron. I will um, find out for you and blog post about it. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, access and filter done to death. Okay, 23C time. Automatic transaction rollback. I saw that in 23C, someone can have a higher priority for a lock on a table, in fact, a table row. What happens when two different priorities are competing for the same lock? So uh, this, I went back and forth with this customer a little bit more to actually understand what they were talking about. And so uh, in, by way of background, in 23C, when you compete for a row or compete for a resource, by default, you know, like all versions of the database, everyone has the same priority. But sometimes that's not what we want. And in 23C, there are actually three priorities we have on offer. There's low, medium, and high. So I'll show you the standard example we've been doing first so you understand how the facility works. And then we'll see an interesting byproduct of because of the fact that you have multiple priorities. So let's give that a go. So to create this, to demonstrate this feature in its base format, right? And this is a really cool feature because it, it reflects the real world. Let me do a simple demo. I'm gonna create a user here called Lazy Connor. That's me and we'll get to why I'm lazy shortly. And I've got another user here called Daily Payroll Batch, the program that runs to pay all the employees in your organization. Would you like to have a guess who's more important in this organization, Lazy Connor or the Daily Patch, Batch Run, you know, the Daily Payroll Run? 
So they're both going to have access to the Scott.em table. And let's now create some problems. I connect as lazy Connor, and I'm lazy, so I do an update on a row. I update employee 7369, and because I'm lazy, I look at the watch, I go, you know, it's time for lunch, and out I go. And of course, what have I forgotten to do? I haven't ended that transaction. So let's flick over to session number two. I've gone to lunch and just after lunch, the daily payroll needs to run. And as you'd imagine, a daily payroll run is a batch program and will need exclusive access probably to all the rows in the employee table. So they come on and in this case, I'm just doing one particular row, but it could be all the rows. I've done for update no way there because as we know, because of lazy Connor who's gone to lunch, I can't get a lot. So no matter what happens, I, the, daily patch run, the daily batch run has now just crashed because of some guy who forgot to commit his transaction. That's very frustrating. So let's roll that back. Let's see how we solve this in 23C. In 23C, we can have these parameters. In this case, I'm setting the auto, this is one of the longest parameters you'll ever see, TXN auto rollback high priority target weight target equals 20. Now the, the name of the parameter isn't too important, but let's come back, let's remember that 20, that's critical here. Let's now redo the demo. I connect as lazy Connor, and I'm still lazy, so this time now, because I'm just your average user, I'm going to change my priority. I'm going to say, for me, this session, my transaction priority is low, because I'm not an important person in this organization, and as we've seen, I'm a risky person because I go to lunch without committing my transactions. So once again, I lock the same row, and once again, I think, ah, oh, it's afternoon tea time, I'll go grab a coffee. So back to session two. This time the batch run comes on. It says now I'm an important session, right? Because as you imagine, daily payroll is a pretty important thing. Let's turn timing on and start doing this update. Now, as you can see, a couple of things to note here. Number one is, even though I'm a low priority, nothing stopped me from getting this lock. I could still get that lock. It didn't stop normal operation. And over here, I still have to wait for the lock. It's not like, you know, because I'm a high priority, I just managed to get locks no matter what. I have to wait because we're hopeful that Lazy Connor will actually do the right thing and commit. But the key thing here is notice the amount of time it took. Eventually, I got the lock. And how long did it take to get the lock? 20 seconds. You can still now see what that parameter value means. If I'm a high priority transaction and I'm trying to get a lock from someone with a lower priority transaction uh, lock, then I'll wait up to 20 seconds before I will just take over. Right? And that's pretty cool because I wanted this to happen. The daily payroll should not be impacted by lower priority people. Now, if this person managed to get a lock, what happened to Lazy Connor? Well, we killed them. Very simple, right? That's how it works. If you're a high priority session and a low priority session has got your lock, we terminate that session in order to release its lock. P1 cleans it up and then I can get the lock. So I think this is a very cool facility. Now, the question that came in relates to what happens when you have a mix? So let's introduce a third person. So we've got Lazy Connor, the Daily Payroll, and now we've got Sleepy Tom. So we've got three people. As you can imagine, Lazy Connor, low priority person, Sleepy Tom, probably not as important as the Daily Payroll. He also gets access to the Scott.emp table. Now, I'm gonna go in as a DBA again and set the medium priority. Now in this case, the medium priority weight target is 10. So in this case, you know, go with me here. This is a bit counterintuitive. You might think the high priority target would be lower than the medium, but I'm going here to see what happens when we start having a, a clash between who should take priority. So the medium weight is 10 seconds. The high priority weight is 20 seconds. So in this window, I'm going to connect as lazy Connor. I'm still a low priority and I take a lock. Now this time I'm going over to session three, which is over here. I'm going to connect in session three now as Sleepy Tom. Sleepy Tom has a priority of medium, and medium's wait time is 10 seconds. So we'll turn on timing here. Right now, I need to go to session two once this starts and press pause here. Okay. So what do we got here? I've got Sleepy Tom, who's prepared to wait up to 10 seconds for a lock. 
I've got the daily payroll who's prepared to wait up to 20 seconds for a lock. And I've got Connor who took the lock and shouldn't have. Now, if I bring all those, whoops, let's bring them all up again so we can see them. Here's the interesting thing. This person should have waited up to 10 seconds and then taken over because that's their priority. This person should have waited up to 20 seconds and then taken over. But look what happened. After lick just a fraction of a second, they got priority. The high person took priority. Now, unfortunately, if we actually added up, it was the time I took to change over. It was actually eight seconds spent here talking to you, followed by two seconds. This is not documented, but my observation is, what I'm seeing is, is that when you have medium and high both competing against someone who locked the rolls are low, then the person who has the high priority wins. When effectively medium or high, they both sort of hit some timeout, the lowest timeout, and they go, okay, who's waiting? Highest gets it. Just let me check the chat. Hey, Jared, need a new one. How are you? Okay, quick answer to your question, then we're back to the video. So Hemant said, kill transaction and disconnect, not just kill current SQL. Yes, we kill the tran we kill the actual session, um, kill the entire session. Um, my guess is we did that because we're just worried about uh, what would happen if we actually killed just that particular um, transaction and then let them continue on. Um, they might not detect that error, etc. So I think we just hose the entire session to make sure that any mess is cleaned up. That's my guess. Um, that's it. It's not current anymore. I guess it's in the past. Joe said the sequel may be part of the session. Have the session. There we go. There you go. Jared answered my question. I should have read the chat first. But yeah, so it's this interesting timing situation where I think what happens is my observation is is that the moment we see that someone of any higher priority is is waiting is stuck. When that timeout expires, we say, okay, who's the highest? Who's the highest in the tree? If is there some mediums and some highs, we're picking the high. And so the high wins out no matter what. And as you can see, our sleepy Tom here is still actually stuck. He's actually still waiting. He's never taken over the high priority person. So we'll commit them, which would actually then free up this person, et cetera, and we're all done. But yeah, an interesting scenario when you have multiple levels all competing for the same resource. Uh, if you don't want to see that, obviously, you would then choose to do something like uh, make sure your high priority targets are always slightly less than your medium targets. But once again, you can, yeah, I'd imagine this all is designed to avoid race conditions. The SQL transpiler. I saw something about a SQL, oh, let me start again. I saw something about a transpiler for SQL in 23C. Does this mean that SQL is compiled to OS executable code for better performance? And the answer is no. Uh, funny enough, when this question came in, I thought, well, what is the difference between a transpiler and a compiler? And a compiler uh, is exactly what you saw there. We basically take some sort of source language and do it into a convert it to a uh, lower representation uh, language form. A transpiler, uh, when I Googled this, it took me to a wiki page, not for transpiler, it took me to a wiki page of source to source. A transpiler takes one source code and converts it to a, another source code. Having said that, I think it's a bad name, even though I suppose marketing wise, it's good to call it a SQL transpiler. I actually think it's a Peel SQL transpiler. And that is we convert Peel SQL code to SQL. So SQL transpiler, I suppose, sounds better, um, but it is actually the target as opposed to the source. And let's have a demo of the SQL transpiler to see why it's pretty cool. So let's explore what the SQL transpiler does. I'm going to start this with a, a demo which is very close to my own heart. I've got a table here called person. It's got a person ID column, a primary key of some sorts, and first name and last name. I insert my Kitra, my manager. I insert Maria Colgan. Most people know her, works at Oracle. And then I insert Larry Ellison. As always, Larry wants to put his name in uppercase. And you know, that's frustrating. So at query time, I want to clean that up. So I could do init cap. Init cap comes along, and as you know, the in it, the initialize the or capitalize the initial character in it cap. So that's corrected all the data and in it cap is fine, but in it cap is not really the most intelligent of all functions, because if I insert myself into that table and I think even though I've got my case right, I'm running in it cap to get all the corrections done. Now, my name is not correctly shown because in it cap doesn't know when McDonald means that the D should be uppercase. It's just a simple grab the first letter. 
in a cap also struggles with things like if you have apostrophes, like if you have like um, O'Brien's or things like that, or you know O dash Brian, it struggles a bit with um, things like that. So it struggles a bit. It's not perfect. As a person who doesn't like my name being you know misspelt or, or incorrectly uh, cased, I wrote my own. So I have my init cap function, which actually looks for things like McDonald's and apostrophes, just to uh, improve upon the delivered init cap function. And now when I run that, it runs great. It solves these ones and it solves mine as well. Now, any DBAs on the call, or no, I, let me rephrase this. Any developers on the call know that when they come to put this into production, they get a phone call. They get a phone call typically from the DBA who is losing their mind. who are going, don't you know the incredible cost of calling peel SQL functions from SQL. We had this context switch. It's going to kill us in terms of performance. They lose their mind. They got all upset with you. And so this becomes a source of frustration. Let's flush the shared pool. And um, so I get rid of that plan out of the pool and now do a new 23C feature called the SQL transpiler. I'm going to turn it on at session level and then turn it on. So I'm now going to run an explain plan for that bad query we just saw, the query that's going to continually flip between the SQL engine and the PL SQL engine, so it can call this my init cap function. If I do DBMSX plan on it, you can see, notice now I've got this interesting filter. And the filter is this big case statement that was previously in my PL SQL code. What a transpiler has done in this particular case in 23C is we've looked into the PL SQL function, discovered that the code in the PL SQL, PL -SQL function could be dragged out and run directly in SQL. We transpiled the PL SQL source into SQL source and folded it into the SQL query. This is pretty cool because we're no longer doing anything through with PL SQL. We're now calling just pure SQL, which is obviously going to give us performance benefits. That's the nice cool thing in the SQL transpiler in 23C. And it's done this automatically. There was, there was nothing to do except flick it on at session level. Having said that, I need to be, uh, give you a word of caution here. This is our first cut at the transpiler. And as you can imagine, what is critical to us is that transpiling your PL SQL code doesn't end up giving you wrong results. So we need to be very, very cautious here. We can't just grab a whole chunk of PL SQL and say, yeah, yeah, let's flip that around into a decode in a case and just ram it in and we'll be good. That would be extremely risky. To give you an example of where we're very cautious, any kind of conditional logic, for example, here, I've got the exact same function. I've wrapped it with if one equals one, which we know is always true. This function is logically identical in functionality to the previous version, but I've just got an if then around it. That's the only change. If I rerun my execution plan, notice we didn't transpile. I'm now still calling my PL SQL function because we were not prepared to take the risk because we saw a conditional piece of logic in there. Yes, we could easily convert that conditional piece of logic to a case statement. But as you can see, we're being very, very cautious. We want to make sure we never give you a wrong result. This facility, I would imagine, will evolve over time. The list of restrictions on what you can do with transpilers is documented. It's in the docs there, and one of them is conditional logic like that. So it's very much designed at those functions, which are just simple. Uh, people generally build these utility functions because they wanted to take some complex code and put it into a simple function name so their code looks neater. But it's very much designed at that kind of use case. I suppose what I'm saying is, is this is really aimed at those systems where, as I said, they've grabbed a lot of little sort of complexity, pushed it into functions in terms of coding modularity. And you, transpiling is about, can we automatically uh, still give you the benefit of having that modular code, but under the covers, drag that code into the SQL engine to make it more performant. It's effectively something that happens silently in the background. If these are utility functions that you've written yourself and you have control over the code base, then it's probably not for you because transpiling, as we said, it has to be extremely cautious as to what's going on here. What might be better if you have control over the code is to use SQL macros because SQL macros from 21C onwards and hence 23C will have the ability to um, have scale at SQL macros. We simply fold PL SQL logic directly into the SQL. We've got some demos coming up to show that. So yeah, so uh, I suppose to summarize, if you're looking at sort of uh, getting automatic performance benefits, look at using the transpiler if you don't have control over the code. 
If you have control over the code and you're on 23C, then SQL macros in the scalar form may be the way to go. Date functions. Hope we're all going strong. My voice is starting to get a bit weary, but we charge on. We might, we might have to get all that stuff done tonight. In fact, speaking of SQL macros. Okay, here's a question that came in. So I think someone was hating on Oracle here. SQL Server has a myriad of functions to easily manipulate dates and times. Why doesn't Oracle have them? And I thought I'd leap straight into a demo uh, to show you how to admit some of the cool things that SQL Server has, which I suppose have evolved from the days of uh, these facilities existing in Visual Basic and Excel and, and the various Office style languages. Um, I think SQL Server simply picked them up along for the ride. But let's go with another demo. So I had a look, I went Googling for the SQL Server manual and there's a stack of date and time functions, but the, mo the most common ones and the ones that seemed to stand out were the fact that you can simply, rather than having to do two char and two number, you can just do a day, day function to get the day out of a date. You can do a month, the year, where you can construct a date using parts. So if I got the year, month and day, I can construct a day. In Oracle, we'd have to sort of, you know, do some concatenation and they have a date diff. If I've got two dates, I can nominate uh, I want the difference in years, the difference in months, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, can we actually exploit these you know, in Oracle? So my point is, yes, SQL Server has them natively, but it's trivial for us to build them in Oracle. So let's do them first, and then we'll explore how we can make them even more performant. So it's very easy to write these functions and use them yourself in Oracle. For a day, we simply two char, two number on two char the day. For a month, same thing on month and for a year, Two, char, two number two char on the year. And we can test these out. Yes, it's the 22nd of February and it's 2024. And I'm very happy with that. At which point you're going, whoa, hold on a second. Context switching, context switching, peel SQL to SQL context switching. We can't have that, right? Well, a couple of things you might want to explore. Number one is, well, where was it? 12.2, maybe 12.2, maybe later. We introduced a pragma called UDF, user defined functions. And that pragma was if you have a user defined PL SQL function that its predominant use will be from the SQL engine, let us know that via a pragma. And then what will happen is we can optimize the calling interface between the two engines. So, to give you a simple example of that, here's a very trivial number function called F1 UDF. It simply takes a number and returns that number plus one. But I've got that pragma in there saying this is a function I'll use almost exclusively from the SQL engine. And I'll create the conventional version of the same function without the pragma. And let's see if actually this claim that we make here at Oracle that UDF functions will run better from SQL engine is actually true. So I'm going to run it a million times. So you can see here I've got a thousand rows from Joule times a thousand from Joule. Cartesian product makes a million rows and I'm calling this function a million times just choosing the max because that way I don't get lots of rows. And it took 0.88 seconds. If I call the UDF equivalent, it's about four times faster. See, we weren't lying to you. This is true. UDF functions can actually be much, you know, pragma UDF functions can be much more performant when they're called from the SQL engine. This is extreme because I'm calling it a million times, but this is often where these scenarios come in when you're scanning huge amounts of rows and applying this function to every single row. So armed with this information, let's now recreate those three functions, the day function with a UDF, month function with the UDF, year function with the UDF. So that's good. Now we can test these as well to see the performance benefit. Because I've replaced these three functions now with Pragma UDF, I'll create a year non-UDF, which doesn't have the Pragma, so we can compare the performance uh, between the two. So I'll run once again a million versions of the year function with the non-UDF, and you can see it takes just about two seconds. Let's now see the benefit of having our UDF in there. And we can see that we don't really get any difference. Yes, UDF is a really cool pragma, but there's obviously some scenarios in which we don't get those perceived benefits of having the pragma in there. I was playing around with this a little bit earlier today, and it seemed to be the case that uh, the sysdate, the passing of sysdate, seemed to sort of defeat any benefits of the UDF. So we're sort of back to where we were before, a little bit stuck in terms of these functions, even with UDFs, are not giving the benefits that we would expect. So we got that SQL to PL SQL context switching problem again. So if we can't use UDF, 
Is there a better option? And yes, from 21C onwards, and I would imagine most of us when we get to it'll be 23C, SQL macros in scalar form. These are huge. I think these the, the scope for these is going to be incredible. Quick Q&A here. Uh, Rachel said, is Pragma UDF available in 19C? Yes. It, I, I think even before. And Judith has pointed out the other bug I had as well. Thank you. Just making sure we clear the queue. So let's recreate our day function, but now using a SQL macro. And what I've got here is that we're returning now no longer a number, we're returning a string because a SQL macro scalar is simply grabbing a piece of text that will be literally injected, that's a terrible use of the term, uh, into your SQL statement. So it's a SQL macro of scalar form, so it's gonna be used as an expression. And we can see I'm returning the string to number to char dd. Same thing for month, same thing for year. I'm now gonna grab that piece of text and put it into my SQL when I call it. So now I can actually call the day function and it does the same results, day, month, year, etc. I actually no longer have a peel SQL interpreted program. It's actually a piece of text that at parsing time is put into my SQL statement. And we can see that this thing is now enormously quicker than calling the peel SQL equivalent. It's now down to 0.3 seconds, previously well, two seconds at best. And that's for a million executions because we're no longer actually even referring to peel SQL. We're simply grabbing that text and putting it into the SQL engine itself. SQL engine, SQL macros, scalar level opens up enormous opportunities. Armed with this information, let's now construct the other facilities that are in SQL Server. Once again, very easy to do with SQL macros. Date from parts. If you pass in me a year, a month, and a day, all I do is effectively fill out the year to four digits, fill out the month to two digits and the date to two digits and put a two date around it. Date from parts, 2023-01-17 gives me 17th of January, 2023. So with SQL macros, it becomes trivial to take these SQL Server functions and have them effectively natively running inside the Oracle SQL engine. Similarly, the date diff one. Date diff is actually quite a uh, impressive function in SQL Server. You give me two dates and you ask for the difference between them, but you can choose the units. So in this case, I've got effectively, uh, I've got if they want the difference in years, then I'll return the year between these two things. This is another cool thing in SQL macros. This SQL macro called date diff is going to use other SQL macros that are previously defined. They can call each other and it's just simply going to nest repeatedly uh, those facilities. So date diff in years between sysdate and sysdate plus 500 is one year. Date diff in months is 16.48 months. I could choose to floor that or seal it if I wanted to. Date diff in hours, minutes, and seconds. Once again, just passing these parameters. All of these things are simply constructing text that will ultimately go directly into my SQL execution stream. That's very cool. And finally, uh, this is one I had on my blog that I sort of include here because this is a really common requirement we have for the new timestamp data types which is people say show me the, dif the dif difference between two timestamps in terms of total number of seconds because in dates it's trivial you take away two dates from each other and you get a new month new a numeric times about 86,400 and the job is done unfortunately for timestamps you get interval data types and taking an interval and converting it to seconds requires several extract functions the cool thing with a SQL macro scalar is you can just put that into a SQL macro and now you have this native function called elapsed time and the job is done. There you go, elapsed time between sysTamp, sysTimestamp and 123 minutes from now is 7,380 seconds. So all very cool. I just dropped these to make sure my database is left clean. As database 23C comes out, because I assume most of us are not on 21C, SQL macros of Scalar is going to let you port just about any function that's available in other databases into the Oracle database simply with a piece of text. And you know, not that I'm trying to sell you anything, but one of the cool things that is it makes your data migration and code migration things that much easier. Because if I've got code written in SQL Server, like things like T-SQL, or I've got things written in Postgres, then a lot of those functions can simply have a SQL macro equivalent and you don't have to do a great deal of code migration. So some really cool stuff coming in 21C onwards with SQL macro scalars. Oh, as I said, SQL macros will be a game changer. Okay, 12 minutes left. Merge with partitions. 
We are using parallel DML to speed up a large merge command into a partition table. However, it is locking the entire table as a result. Can this be avoided? And we'll do a demo here. The key thing here is there is a subtle difference when it comes to table versus partition level locking, depending on how you phrase your DML. So we're gonna do a little demo here to show you uh, some of the things you can do to make sure you can maximize uh, the availability of your table if it's partitioned while you're doing DML. Okay, I'm gonna create a table called T. I'm going to partition by list automatic because I'm just a lazy typist. And I'm simply taking a copy of DBA objects with this extra column called X, which is the modulo of 10. So as you can imagine, it's gonna have 10 distinct values and I'm gonna partition by each of these. So I've got zero through nine for my values of X and that gives me a 10 or 11 partitions here because X could be null as well. Effectively, my automatically generated partitions for my table. Uh, X equals one gives me a partition, X equals zero gives me a partition and so forth. I'm gonna have another table called T1 which is partitioned almost identically except the values will be tenfold. So the distinct values are 0, 10, 20, etc. just so it looks a little bit different. But same thing, 10 partitions in here. Once again, automatically list partitioned. One of these is my source, one of these is my target, and I'm going to do a merge command. So here's the problem that was being encountered. I'm doing a merge here on just one particular partition, and I'm doing it with parallel DML because that lets us consume lots of resource on our server. Uh, just by the way, if, if you're unfamiliar with this, uh, or unaware that this hint existed, uh, many people who have been working with the database for a long time uh, worked under the premise that if you wanted to do parallel DML, you had to do alter session enable parallel DML. Uh, you can do it and, at a statement by statement level now with a hint. So I can say for this particular statement, I actually want to enable parallel DML and I want to do it parallel too. I actually didn't need uh, these in here as well, but I'm just a cut paste lazy person. But as you can see, I'm taking all the rows from T1 for X equals 10. That'll be part the one single partition and merging it into T for X equals one, which will also be a single partition. And I'm just doing a simple update here. Similarly, if I try then do another merge for a different partition, this is the second partition with the second partition and another source, I get an error. With parallel DML, as we know, you can only do one and then you must end the transaction. So if I want to do these, then I've got a problem because I can only do one at a time and that's to end the transaction each time. Can we do better? I'll commit it to free up all that stuff. Let's now dig into perhaps, you know, uh, how the optimizer is running these merge statements. So if I look at the access, the, the source data, or that the target was T, if I look for just the partition one, does the optimizer know just from that select star statement that I'm accessing just one partition? And as we can see, it does. It says I'm doing a partition list single, and that partition is partition number five in this case. If I do from T1, this was the merge source as opposed to the merge target for x equals 10 same thing the optimizer knows just from that that yes i'm once again just accessing the fifth partition so it knows this so it knows that in both cases both the source and the target are simply accessing a single partition but if i ask it to explain the actual merge which once again is yep we know that's one partition we know that's one partition it's there almost it says yes i'm doing a single partition but notice we've lost access to knowing in advance what that partition is. But it still knows that uh, you know it's definitely gonna be a one partition join between these two objects. I just don't know them at parsing time. It says it's a key provided. What if I do it in parallel, which is the desired command here? Okay, I hope that still fits on your screen. Everyone can see it. Now we got partition this single here, but it's dropped off here. Now we still have this partition start and stop being a key, but you sort of have this inclination here that as we've added more complexity, the parallel stuff as well, we're starting to sort of um, lose a little bit of the partition known in advance, right? And that can create problems. Let's explore why. As we saw, if I wanna do multiple partitions, I have to end the transaction with one before I can do the other. A logical extension that would be, let's do each of the various partitions in multiple sessions, so I can divide it. <laughs> there goes the microphone. Too much hand waving. So I can, let, let me start again. What was I saying? Yep, so if I'm trying to, I want to get this economies of scale of doing merges on multiple partitions, and I can't do it in a single session, maybe I'll run multiple sessions, each one doing a particular partition. 
So in this case, I've got partition, the first position where x equals 1, and then I go to session number 2. Uh, merge 2. And I'm going to try do the second partition. So as we saw, these two things are accessing totally separate partitions, yet notice this one is stuck. This one has locked the entire table, even though we know that both these operations are a single partition only. That's frustrating. So I'll commit that so we can actually see that this one has now been freed up, but we'd like to do better. Here's the way you can achieve it. I don't know why the optimizer can't do this by itself, but it's just an unfortunate um, restriction. So here's how we can solve it ourselves. In this case, it's the exact same merge. Rather than using a predicate, I'm going to explicitly nominate that partition, which means I have some extra work to do as a developer. I would need to take my values and work out what the partition is and then explicitly code it, probably with dynamic SQL. For this I'm saying go get the partition for the value of x equals 1. Then I go over here. And I say, let's go get the partition for the value of x equals 2. And notice it was not stopped. When I explicitly nominate the partitions, then I actually get this benefit of being able to do multiple merges, each on disparate partitions on the table. So if I had 20 partitions to merge, I could have 20 sessions, for example, with a job scheduler, and it would go ahead and do them all concurrently and get all the value that I need. If I go back to session one and commit, and we're done. Uh, interestingly, you'll think, well, seeing as that worked, if I do an explain plan on this partition exclusive, yeah, explicitly nominated partition, I'll see better information inside the explain plan. But in fact, I see the identical explain plan from before. It says I've got a single partition on the source, but nothing that tells me I'm doing a single partition on the target. So the explain plan didn't give me any clues that the actual uh, facility using explicit partition naming was going to be actually better. So as I'm saying, some care is needed and just looking at the explain plan might not be enough to know that you'd be able to actually get these concurrent mergers running for different partitions. Okay, it's 9.57. What's the next one? Better lobs. Yeah, let's do, let's do one more. We might run a couple minutes over, but let's do better lobs because this is a 23C thing. You like this one. This actually uh, came from a uh, person who came to my session in India. I came to your 23 session in Pune last week. In one of the slides, you mentioned more flexible lobs in 23C. What is better about lobs in 23C? And there's two core features, I think called lobs for value, which we won't talk about, and some controls over lob sizes, which I think is super cool. And I thought we will show that tonight. So let's bring up a window. Okay, this one, we're going to jump into the weeds a little bit here. We're going to look at a few block dumps and stuff, but we, we've got to get this done fast. So we're going to run through this fast. I'm going to create a directory inside my database, which actually points to the trace directory on my database server. Because what I want to do is I actually want to dig into some trace files, but from within my SQL Plus session. I'm going to create a table called T with a clob in it, enable storage in rows. And as we know, you can have a certain amount of bytes in line in a lob before the database, even if you nominate it as being a enable storage in row, that it'll force it out anyway. And we can demonstrate that. Let me put a clob here, which is 512 characters long. Now, this is a UTF-8 database. So 512 characters is actually double that internally. And let's explore if we can prove that. So I'm going to flush out the buffer case, do a global checkpoint, so anything that's in memory is flushed out to disk. I can actually find the block number and file that that one row is actually stored in using dbms row id and if i know that i can actually dump that information out and dump it out to a trace file i can look at v dollar diag info which is available in my session to see what my trace file will be and i can actually do alter system dump data file the file number and block number from up here so i've taken that block which has my clob in it and i've dumped it out to a trace file my trace file was also stored in a directory which I previously named tracedir. So I can actually run a select star from an external table which I dynamically create on the fly using my trace file name. And I'm only gonna look for entries that look like this, which is the information I'm looking for in a block dump. Isn't this a cool way of using Oracle technology? Directories, external definitions, block dumps, clobs. We run that and this is what comes out of my block row dump. 
it says that my TLOB was actually 1055 bytes long. This makes sense because it's 512 characters. You double that because every blob, every TLOB is stored as two bytes in UTF-8 because it's stored in the UCS2 uh, character system. And we get a little bit of overhead as well. So it's a kilobyte in size. Okay, let's now do the same demo, but I'm gonna make my TLOB now 2000 characters in size. Go through the exact same thing, flush it out, find its block, find the trace file, dump it out to the trace file, get my external table, spit it out, and notice it's no longer there. 2000 characters is 4000 bytes. The limit for a TLOB being stored in line is about 3,900 bytes, somewhere in there. I can't remember the exact number, but it's in that vicinity. So you had this issue. The club got too big. You wanted it in line. The database said no, and it stored it elsewhere. This is now just a pointer to where it is stored in a separate lob segment. If I go look at this and actually query now, once again, the trace file and dig out some other stuff, you can see that a lob locator is effectively here, 130, that's 38 bytes long, which was that value you saw earlier in. I've just pulled out a different piece of the block dump here to actually see that value. This is the cool thing that's coming in 23C. For a lot of us, we've had that issue where we say, well, you know, all my clobs are gonna be about say 5,000 bytes. And I know, I know a block is 8,000 bytes long, or it might be 16K, et cetera. Can't I just have a bit more control? And now you can. In 23C, I can say enable storage in row, and I want to be able to have up to 8,000 bytes in line. I'm not now bound to that hard-coded limit of 3,900, and I think it might be 3,968, but at this hard-coded limit of bytes. So I can actually nominate my own. So now I'll put in my 2,000 characters again, which is 4,000 bytes. We just saw that would normally be flicked over into its own segment. Do the exact same thing, find my trace file, dump out the block, build it up, and there it is, stored in line. Once again, overcoming that previously hard-coded limit. Now, if I go too big, if I go 3,900, right, dump it out, right, that's squeezed in. 3,900 came to 7,831, which is less than 8K. That's squeezed in as well. If I went to, say, 4,000 or 4,100, remember, that's characters. That would bump out to 8,200 bytes, which would overblow both my 8,000 limit and the block size, and we'd be back into lob locator territory. But still, very cool, especially if you have particular requirements, especially in the world now of things like JSON and stuff like that, or uh, unstructured data, which is say, let's say in the 10K range, finally, we might have a really good use for perhaps a dedicated 16K block size in a table space, so we could guarantee that certain large-ish lobs are stored in line so they can be accessed extremely quickly as opposed to going through lob segments and locators. And on that note, let's call it quits. I only went three minutes over. Thank you for hanging around very much. Um, I know that there's a very cool Apex talk going on in office hours to speak. So thank you as always for your time. It's a pleasure having you here. My voice is held out. But yes, uh, as always, Love having you on the call. Thank you for your interaction. Thank you for pointing out any bugs in my code. I'll have to fix that. I'll probably re-record it so it works. And yeah, we'll see you next month in office hours. Until then, please hit me up on Twitter if you have questions and comments. Uh, thanks for your time and we'll see you next month on office hours. Bye for now, everybody.